scuttle and protect it from the dangers of radiation damaging the film. This is below the vanillin radiation belts. And they actually put their film camera, the magazines, in between the water containers. Water is a very good protection against radiation. It's not quite the same as um, saying that it, it's, it's dangerous for you and me to go there. You take a piece of photographic paper and stick it in, in this light. It ain't going to zap you, but it's certainly going to do something to that paper. We, we're not talking about the same level of radiation at all. What, on, uh, on Earth? No, so you've got to do a, a film. If, if radiation will go through the can, then the exposure of the film, that's proven compared to your say, you've got the proof of the of radiation now and survive. Yeah. They're, not, they're not of the same order. No, possibly not, but... Okay, when you buy a, a roll of photographic film, any photographic film, whether it's print film or colour film, it will always have a use-by date on it. Okay, now why is that? Because film is not biological matter. The reason is that if you keep it for a long time, here on, in, you know, in your sitting room, if you keep it for 10 years, you can't use it. It's fogged. Levels of radiation, are, even down here, are such that photographic film is affected by it. My point is that if you go out beyond the protection of the Van Allen belts, which are quite severely radioactive, it will affect photographic film. And none of the photographs we saw there had any radiation damage at all, which can be easily seen. It's, it's basically a misting of the film, a fogging. And we recollections. Hmm? Can you speak up? Sorry, it's my somewhat weak recollection of the physics of, of the upper atmosphere and beyond is everything to go by. Most of the rep the Van Allen belt is alpha and beta. It's not gamma. Right. You're not going to get a lot of damage to the tissue. Are you alpha, sure alpha and beta is not going to do you a lot of damage. Are you sure alpha, alpha can be stopped by a cheap paper. Are you sure that that is all there is in the Van Allen belts? There is gamma, but there's not a lot of it. It's cosmic rays. But they ignore human flesh. Okay. And Earth, for that matter, most of the time. This is one of the problems of, of getting information that we can all agree on. When Professor James Van Allen sent his Geiger counter up and it registered extreme radioactivity, what was he measuring? It depends on what it was set to measure. Hmm? It depends on what it was set to measure. If it was well, set to measure alpha or beta, rather then, than gamma rays. And that well, Basically, he sent the Geiger counter up. It's the same Geiger counter as you would put into a nuclear reactor to see if it was safe to walk in it it would measure radioactivity. Now, if somebody comes along with a guy counter and says, yeah, here, this thing's just gone off the scale, I'm not gonna say, well, let's have a picnic, I'm gonna say, let's get out of here. Now, the same thing happened at Chernobyl. My question to NASA was, if these spacesuits, which you've equipped the astronauts with, are so good at protecting them from the radiation in space, couldn't they be used by technicians to go into Chernobyl or Three Mile Island and clear up the mess? And they said, no. You have to ask why. Did they carry any protection? There's none in it. I've read the specification of the spacesuits. There's none in it. And by the way, the spacesuits were made by the International Latex Company, a division of Playtex. Very suitable people to choose to use, make spacesuits, but they didn't provide any radiation protection. And I have to ask why. The cameras had none on them. The spacecraft had none on it. So how come the film is undamaged? Now, if I say that no living person has traveled beyond the Van Allen radiation belts, I'm probably stretching your plausibility threshold too far. But think about it. If you agree that radiation is not a danger, why has nobody ever gone beyond them since? Why have the Russians never attempted to, having said that they would, didn't want to harm their own cosmonauts? There is a major problem. There is a question that has yet to be answered. And that's all I'm doing. I'm saying, well, let's try and answer the question. So if there's a nuclear physicist here, am I right that there's a danger up there? Or is it safe to go and sunbathe? Because we get a great tan on the moon. No clouds. Okay, let's have another question. Uh, <laughs> well, that's just standing up. I suppose we'll let you. Go on then. 
this is changing tack a little bit. And I think some of those photos, the photos that you showed are convincing in the sense that they were used to make publicity for NASA later. Photos were fake, that doesn't mean that lunar landings never took place. It's more an understanding of human nature and conspiracies. The conspiracies can succeed over a period. A very few number of people must be involved. Someone's going to blow the whistle for whatever reason. Um, mm, I have. Well, 400,000 people worked for NASA, directly worked for NASA during the 60s. At the time of Apollo, there was actually not quite that number because they didn't need them to build the rockets. They'd all been built. Well, let's say 400,000. A lot of people. Can 400,000 people keep a secret? Yes, of course they can. Did the 400,000 people who worked for Apollo keep it? They didn't need to. I'm saying that they could keep it. The Manhattan Project was kept secret. The Enigma Project was kept secret. Many, there are many examples of large numbers of people being aware of something and not talking about it. However, if what I'm contending happened did, not many people would need to know. Not many people would be required to know because they were all doing the very best job they could. They were building the best rockets they could, the best spacesuits, the best control centers. They were doing the best training they could. They were doing the best PR they could. They were producing the cameras and everything that was required. The point I made there, as soon as the rocket cleared the tower, for, that was in Florida, the next thing you know is that um, Houston, in Texas, a thousand miles away, take over. If you've ever seen the Mission Control Center, if you've ever been in there, the only thing we ever see of it is the control room, where all the television screens and the important looking people are saying yes, I'll, no, I'll, and all the rest of it. What you don't see are the computer banks behind there, running the simulated programs alongside other programs. This is going on the whole time. You see them reading their computer screens. What are they reading? What are they actually reading? What we think they're reading is direct transmission from the command module or the lunar module. No, they're not. That's not what they're reading. They're being fed information. You see the pictures, man on the moon, Armstrong walking down. Was that real? I can make a very strong case for saying it was recorded. Recorded many times. That he actually had to say the line several times. He kept fluffing it. He wasn't an actor. That's why you never see his face. You know, I can go on. It doesn't really matter. The point is that there are anomalies which have yet to be properly addressed. Now, you may have seen the program NASA Triumph and Tragedy last Wednesday. And it was a brilliant program. All the astronauts were there. Totally convincing. We're going to get another dose of it tomorrow. And I shall watch it again. It'll be totally convincing. And you'll think about, who, who was that chap yesterday who was talking about this? I, what was he on about? That's what propaganda is about. And there are some brilliant exponents of propaganda. We were all convinced that a certain gentleman in the Middle East had weapons of mass destruction. He didn't, as it turned out, and fortunately it could easily be found whether he had or not, because you just go and look. Nobody can go back to the moon and look. And that's the problem. So the plausibility threshold is probably set a little bit high that if I'm asking you to take on board the fact that something that for 40 years you may have thought is ludicrous, may well have a degree of truth about it, is a difficult step to make. And it took me a long time. If you're coming to this for the first time, if you have decided, well, I'll find out what this conspiracy theorist chap's all about, and if you have doubts, fine, check it out yourself, nasa.gov, that one. You go on there, and in the search box you find you put Lunar Surface Journal, and you get every photograph taken on any of the Apollo missions. All the pictures I've shown, that's where they came from. If you want to see the... Um, oh, I didn't show up very clearly. It's uh, Aulis, A-U-L-I-S dot com, Aulis dot com. If you want to check some of the photo analysis and the stories. David Percy spent eight years researching it.